Shortly after I was invited to speak here, I got on Facebook uh, to put a status on, um, on just how excited I was at the opportunity to write and to deliver an atheist sermon. And uh, right away, my cousin, my younger cousin, uh, left a comment saying, um, um, I, think, I think atheist sermon might be an oxymoron. <laughs> to which I replied, well, you've never been to a Unitarian church. Any church uh, where we can read Robert Ingersoll to, uh, to laughter and nods of approval is the kind of church I could get into. <laughs> I feel comfortable here because we are all heretics in this room, at least according to the scores of Calvinists that live in our area, <laughs> and according to sociologist Peter Berger, who thinks we are all heretics just by living in a pluralistic society. The English word heresy comes from the Greek verb which means to choose. And in a society as diverse as ours, none of us are stuck with the religion we were raised in. Unlike most humans for most of human history, we have real alternatives. This is why to Berger, we all face what he calls the heretical imperative. No one can avoid choosing their religious identity for themselves. And this freedom comes with a tremendous responsibility, of course, because nothing shapes who we are and what we value more than our convictions concerning ultimate reality. I am here to represent people who do not worship any gods, people who choose to live without belief in the supernatural. We are called by many names, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, skeptics, and secular humanists. I'm comfortable with any of these labels, but please do not call me an unbeliever. If you ask, you'll find there are many things I believe in, and I suspect you probably share some of those beliefs. I believe through reason, observation, and experiment, we limited human beings can find some measure of understanding in this world. I believe that the pursuit of truth and the cultivation of virtue are the most noble of human aspirations. I believe that patriarchy, authoritarianism, and fundamentalism are the greatest threats to human progress. I believe that the survival of the human species depends on education and empowerment of women worldwide. I believe that friendship is what makes life bearable. We should choose our friends carefully, but once chosen, we should give ourselves to them fully. I believe in many things, and these beliefs help me make sense of the world. They inform my goals. They direct my actions. I turn to them in times of hardship and uncertainty because they remind me of who I am and the purpose I've chosen for my life. It's not a lack of beliefs which earns me and my fellow atheists that label unbeliever. It's our lack of faith. The vast majority of the people living on this planet believe in a God or some other higher reality that transcends the physical world. Having faith seems to be as ordinary a human activity as breathing. It's only natural to regard the relatively few of us who reject the supernatural with suspicion. Why haven't they signed on to faith? Well, to answer that, we must return back to that heretical imperative that I spoke of earlier. We must choose our religious identity for ourselves. But faced with so many options, how do we choose? By the authority of a tradition or scriptures? Whose tradition? Which scriptures? Christians and Muslims both take their scriptures to be the word of God, but the Bible and the Quran contradict on numerous essential points of doctrine. By what criteria can we decide which scriptures are truly inspired by God and which are merely the invention of human beings? What about miracles? Both Hindus and Catholics point to supposed miraculous events and supernatural signs as proof of their claims. On what ground do we affirm Catholic miracles yet deny Hindu miracles? What about personal religious experience? What about the power of religion to transform lives? Many Christians insist that they know their faith is true because they can feel God's presence. They have a direct knowledge of God through the inner witness of the Spirit. But Muslims also feel the divine peace that comes with submission to Allah. Zen Buddhists catch a direct glimpse of enlightenment through the experience of Satori. Every one of these faiths can point to people who've turned away from violence or substance abuse through the redemptive power of their religions. So on what basis, other than prejudice or arbitrary preference for my own tradition, do I take the experience of Christians seriously and simply dismiss the experience of Jews, Muslims, Hindus, 
and Buddhists. Perhaps in the end it all boils down to faith. Perhaps you must first believe and then you will see the truth. But what help is that? Centuries ago, Julius Caesar observed, men are generally ready to believe what they wish to be true. Knowing this, we should be all the more hesitant to simply commit to believing something where evidence has failed us. Atheists believe in many things, but we do not accept the authority of tradition or scriptures. We do not trust in the words of self-styled prophets or the inner conviction of the spirit. We put little stock in miraculous visions or personal experiences of the divine because we reason that these methods cannot be reliable guides to truth if they lead to such radically divergent views on reality. For this, we are often accused of arrogance, and I understand that. After all, what could be more audacious than to trust one's own fallible judgment over the eternal truths of the Creator? I, however, believe this skepticism is rooted in a profound humility. It comes from a deep appreciation of human fallibility and of how easily we are taken in by self-consoling fantasies. It comes from a rare willingness to be self-critical, to root out the errors and delusions in one's own thought in hope of seeing the world more clearly. Consider this quote from the Irish feminist and freethinker Iris Murdoch. By opening our eyes, we do not necessarily see what confronts us. We are anxiety-ridden animals. Our minds are continually active, fabricating an anxious, usually self-preoccupied, often falsifying veil, which partially conceals the world. Our fantasies and our reveries are not trivial and unimportant. They are profoundly connected with our energies and our ability to choose and act. If quality of consciousness matters, then anything which alters consciousness in the direction of unselfishness, objectivity, and realism is to be connected with virtue. Iris Murdoch was not the first to realize that the pursuit of truth may ask even more of our character than it does of our intellect. It requires not only humility, but the openness to consider contrary viewpoints, the integrity to judge one's own beliefs and the beliefs of others by the same standards the patience to suspend judgment until the evidence is in, the persistence to think through difficult problems, the courage to follow the evidence wherever it leads, and the flexibility to change one's beliefs should they be cast into doubt by new evidence. Believe it, my good friend, wrote John Locke in a letter to Anthony Collins, to love truth for truth's sake is the principal part of human perfection in this world and the seed plot of all other virtues. So if we love truth for truth's sake, if we wish to push our consciousness in the direction of unselfishness, objectivity, and realism, then how should we proceed? Since we know our hopes and our intuitions so often lead us astray, since we know our reason is so often in error, we need some sort of external check on our beliefs. We need an impartial source against which we can test our theories so that we can discover when we are indeed wrong. No holy book can meet this challenge, but the book of nature can. Nature cares not at all for our feelings. She has no interest in confirming our prejudices or affirming our delusions. Claims that require the authority of a guru, mystical insight, or the eyes of faith are by their very nature undemocratic. They are only for the elect. But nature has no elect. She will give her secrets to anyone, regardless of race, gender, or circumstances of birth. Nature never asks us to take things on faith. She implores us to look beyond mere appearances, to investigate deeply into her inner workings and to see the truth for ourselves. To the degree that it is possible, I believe we should limit our beliefs to that which we can observe in the natural world or that which we can reasonably infer from those observations. We should all adopt the attitude of that annoying math teacher who told you, don't just give me the answers, show me your work. Now, of course, we only ever see nature through human eyes, so again, we must be humble. We should not pretend that we can understand nature's ways without making assumptions, without forming theories. Fine. But let them be cautious. 
Make sure they are logically sound. Check that they are coherent with previously discovered knowledge and expect them to lead to new insights and discoveries. And when they do not, discard them and start over again. I wish to be careful not to be misunderstood. I'm not proposing that truth be so narrowly defined as to only include scientific knowledge. I'm not denying the existence of a priori truths, nor am I denying the importance of socially constructed systems of meaning. I'm not denying the importance of human subjectivity either. Philosophy, art, personal introspection, all are essential to a rich understanding of what it means to be human. But when it comes to reality, that which exists prior to and independent of ourselves, we should limit our claims to that which can be tested against the natural world. Some might object, as the eminent scientist and philosopher William James did, that if we limit our understanding in this way, won't we run the risk of missing out on profound, ineffable, even life-altering truths? Yes, we might. But that's the price of getting it right. Or as Nelson Goodman put it, you may decry some of these scruples and protest that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in my philosophy. Perhaps. I am concerned, rather, that there should not be more things dreamt of in my philosophy than are in heaven or earth. More often the objection we hear is that without the supernatural, the universe is devoid of wonder, hope, meaning, and purpose. Don't you long to be a part of something larger than yourself? Don't you want your life to be significant? I never know how I should answer these questions. Uh, On the one hand, I am eager to affirm that naturalism presents us with a view of the world that's just as beautiful as the ones we'll find in any religion. On the other hand, a world without the supernatural really does confront us with some disturbing possibilities. And I feel we ought to confront these head on instead of just grasping at consolations. So let's start with the affirmative side. In the beginning, all the atoms that make up your body were once in the heart of a star. Inside that solar furnace, Nuclei of hydrogen atoms fuse together to make the heavier elements required for life. When that star died, those elements were released into the open vastness of space. Over time, gravity brought those elements back together again to form new stars and planets. And at least one of those planets had a handful of these atoms that began to do something quite amazing. By no other force but the laws of physics and chemistry, they formed long chains of macromolecules determined by their chemistry to make crude copies of themselves. The first cells formed and began to divide. Some cells stuck together after dividing and began to differentiate their functions, leading to the first multicellular organisms. Some evolved limbs and antennae, patches of cells sensitive to heat and pressure, and suddenly the universe could feel. Some evolved cells which could detect light and the direction of its source. Some even had primitive lenses that could focus that light, and suddenly the universe could see. Some of these organisms evolved tiny models of reality within their nervous systems, internal representations of their own body in the outside world, and suddenly the universe could experience. It could predict events. It could even, to some degree, control its responses. Some of these organisms evolved the ability to use concepts and language, and suddenly the universe could communicate. It could look upon itself with wonder, and it could ask, who am I? So to the person who says, but don't you want to be a part of something larger than yourself? I say, you might know the science, but you've somehow failed to comprehend what you truly are. Don't you see that you are the latest stage in a complex chemical reaction that's been taking place for billions of years? Don't you see that there is an unbroken chain of heredity that unites you to every other living thing on this planet and even the stars themselves? You are not just a collection of atoms. You are atoms with awareness. You are not just matter. You are matter with meaning. As Carl Sagan so simply put it, you are a way for the universe to know itself. 
What could you ever hope to be that is that grand? But in the scope of eternity, aren't we all just insignificant specks of dust? Don't for a second believe that just because you are small and your time here is short that you are somehow insignificant. That star of ours shining up there in the sky, actually.